Welcome everyone to Chicken Care 101, Internal Parasites. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a large topic. That's it's a why large topic. It's a huge topic. So this is why I've decided to break it down into probably a couple. Yeah. <laughs> I feel uh, like Chicken Care 101 has just been a breakdown of a breakdown. Yeah, yeah. Well, we tried to keep it an overview, but we realized that there is a lot of information. And so in this episode, we're going to cover... Uh, two different types of internal parasites. We're going to cover worms. We'll go over the basic sort of categories of worms, what they look like, their life cycle. And by exploring that a little bit, I'm hoping that we're going to give you some uh, ideas on how best to uh, prevent worms in a lot of ways, or at least realize what sort of challenges are out there. And then the second one, we're going to talk about protozoas. Now, protozoas uh, include things like coccidiosis, which is probably the number one parasite of uh, chickens in the world. Um, it's the biggest problem that they face. So we'll talk a little bit about that and some real basic strategies on how to manage that. Um, I'll have notes, but I'll probably talk a little bit more around the subject. So if you do have questions or there's something in particular you need to uh, uh, just ask and I'll try to cover it as best I can. Okay. All right, here we go. <laughs> We're not talking gummy worms, although they're delicious. Uh, we're going to be talking the other worms. Okay, so there's some big families of worms. And this uh, Ascarids is probably the largest worm you're going to see. It's the one that makes all the photos, really, um, or the ones that you're going to see in droppings, if you see any at all. Um, it tends to be these ones. They're large. Uh, they're quite visible. Um, you know, it's really hard to miss these ones. Um, Ascrids have different species uh, and they range uh, from a whole bunch of different sort of animals, pigs, humans have their own species of them. Okay. So in this case, you know, they're very, very big, five centimeters plus. Uh, they affect chickens and pigeons, uh, parrots. You can get some cross infection in those categories. So that's an important thing if you are carrying pigeons uh, with chickens or mixing flocks or like some people have a, a variety of different birds at home, okay? Um, the eggs are quite large, so they're very resistant. Uh, they have a big sort of shell around them. They can last months in the dirt, uh, especially in coops, anywhere like outside of, um, well, anywhere outside in the dirt, but if they get sort of contact with UV and stuff, uh, they're a little bit less infective, they can, um, they can die off pretty quick, but they can last a long time. So bear that in mind. The main sort of life cycle is a direct life cycle. So that means the worms are inside. Uh, we have a diagram, but the worms are inside. They release eggs in the droppings. The bird somehow consumes some of those droppings and gets the infective egg. The egg hatches via digestion. So in the, in the crop, in the um, proventriculus, in the gizzard, those uh, gastric acids digest off the eggshell and the juvenile worm hatches. And in this case, the ascrid buries itself in the villi of the tissue. So the villi are these really microscopic sort of finger protrusions that kind of go into the lumen and the worm will kind of weave itself in there for protection. Everything you just said just said, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's absolutely horrible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And it takes about, so once it hatches, it takes about three weeks for that larva to grow into an adult to produce eggs. And so this is where we get start getting our regimes for treating worms is these two to three week sort of uh, windows, okay? All right, heterachis. So this is another category of roundworms, okay? They're very small. Uh, you have to really want to find them to, to, to see them. And they usually live at the end of Sika. For those of you who don't know, a Sika is at the sort of um, the bottom end of the intestinal system. And it's these two little blind sacs that come off the uh, large intestine at the end. And they sort of do a, a water absorption fermenting type process. You, you probably recognize the Sika droppings. This is where that sort of dropping is made. And they live at the end of those blind sacs for the most part, okay? These guys have a direct and indirect life cycle. Um, and these worm eggs are carried in off of earthworms. So they infect earthworms. The earthworms get eaten by the chicken. The heterachis egg hatches out in the chicken and then infects the Sika that way. 
Okay. Essentially, wormception, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Worm, worm inception. Worm. A worm within a worm. <laughs> and then on top of that, inside the worm within a worm, there's a little protozoa named Histomoniasis megridis, and that causes a condition called blackhead. And that's gonna we're gonna cover that one in our protozoal section. All right, our third type uh, is capillaria. Uh, it's a hair-like worm. So a lot of these, they have nicknames, hair worms, hook worms, tape worms, okay? Uh, this is long and thin, which is where it gets its name from. Um, the, the, the thing to remember with this one is that it buries itself deep in sort of the intestinal cell. So it'll actually create like a little cavity underneath the, between the layers of intestine mm -hmm. and it will live in there and happily live in there while it grows and it's protected from the immune system. And then once it gets to a certain size, it sort of hatches, it's like aliens a little bit. It comes out of the tissue, then it starts to replicate or reproduce then, okay? So we don't, with that one, yeah. like cause you're saying that it's quite small and the immune system doesn't quite hit it. Yeah. Does that mean that there's no inflammation happening in the intestinal tract while that worm is in there being very that's, little? Yeah, that's right. But it isn't until it gets older and larger that it kind of breaks out and yeah. creates like more of an inflammatory effect. Yeah, yeah. So when it when it buries itself, you'll get a bit of inflammation. And when it ruptures back out, you'll get some inflammation. Um, and this actually causes a huge problem with treating it because you can get, you can treat it and you can kill off all the adults. And then in a couple of days, you might get another sort of emergence of younger worms. Mm -hmm. So in this case with capillaria, we often have to do multiple back-to-back -back days. So like if you do a fecal egg count, and this is one of the worms that you have in there, you tend to have to do at least two days. And you, that way you, you kill off those ones that are emerging from the tissue mm -hmm. as well. And then, so every time you treat, uh, you probably have to do two, three days, sometimes more depending on how bad the burden is. Um, and this one has a direct life cycle, so it can be picked up from droppings as well, or an indirect life cycle, again, from earthworms. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, this is one you see a lot. Yeah. <laughs> So it's like the famous Facebook photo. Yeah, yeah. So tapeworms are yeah, that's true. Right? Tapeworms are one of those um, one of those worms that is kind of in a class all its own. It's technically a flatworm, um, or there's a there's a few different classes, but technically it's a flatworm, and it doesn't react to like tapeworms don't usually react or can't be treated with your regular. Uh, worming medication. So like your um, uh, levamazole, so your aviverm or something doesn't always kill these ones. They're, they can be quite resistant to a lot. And there's a only a few products that actually work with these. So they're usually quite long and thin. Um, you know, they release what's called the proglottid, which is the tail end. And those are little sacs that release more uh, scolex or scolexia, which are like the uh, eggs, but they're also the head. They have this little hooked mouth on the end and they kind of grab onto the tissue mm -hmm. and then kind of replicate off the back end. But those little scolexia are, are microscopic. These eggs are microscopic. You need to do either a, a fecal smear or a fecal egg count. You can see them on fecal egg counts. Um, and these guys, their life cycles are always usually, well, are always indirect. I would say that always usually <laughs> it's like a yeah now nah, tag thing but they're always like sort of yeah they're indirect so they which means they need a secondary host to get into their primary host so if the chicken or turkey is the sort of primary host that they want to get into um, there's a, a a part of their life cycle where they infect something like an insect a beetle or like snails or slugs or something like that and then just like the earthworm it has to be ingested by the chicken and then it will become infective after that, okay? And these tapeworms, they tend to have the sort of longest lifespan out of all those. Mm -hmm. So it takes sometimes, you know, six weeks or, uh, to get from infection to a tapeworm that's actually producing those proglottids that are kind of, you can see there in our picture, kind of mm -hmm. shed, shed out the back end. Awesome. Everybody's favorite. Yeah, the one that apparently every chicken has. <laughs> yeah. Well, Super rare. <laughs> yeah, well, because it's 
it's an easy way. It, it has a great name, a gape worm. Uh, gape worms are very unique. Uh, they are, there's different species of gape worms. Again, uh, we're just going to cover one, uh, but this one does infect a range of different birds. Okay. So, um, it has a, again, a, a indirect, a direct and indirect life cycle, this one, but, uh, it's the internal life cycle. That's actually quite interesting where like, uh, let's say a snail is adjusted by the chicken. The egg hatches again in the sort of digestive tract. And once it gets into the intestine, that larva actually tunnels its way out of the intestine into the, the circulatory system, so into the blood vessels, Oof. and then cycles through the liver and then through the heart and then ends up sort of trapped in the lungs. And when it gets to the lungs, it sort of eats its way out of the lungs into the, like the, the bronchi and then up the trachea into the mouth. And that's how that's how it gets there. I'm hearing nothing poison tonight. <laughs> Any of these the, guys. Eh? The, these are literally little horror shows. <laughs> and they they can that so that trip that they go through doesn't always work. They can end up in different organ systems like kidneys and the liver and stuff. And sometimes you get weird reactions when they do that. Um, there's other species too, like Oxyurus, which is in this family, um, and it's that whole family of stuff uh, of worms is um, considered like eye worms where they hatch and live in the vitriol of the eye. So into the fluidy parts of it. And oftentimes, uh, if you look closely enough, you can see them sort of moving uh, in the cornea or just in the iris there. And often uh, we've seen it once, I think, in one client where uh, mm. she had a chicken where it looked like it was reacting to stuff and it had a an eye worm and we had to treat it for that. So it is possible. It was probably this worm that just kind of got lost and ended up in the back of the eye. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, yeah. All right. So here's what I was saying. So poultry DVM, a great little site for everybody that's got a whole bunch of good information. Um, this is a basic uh, direct life cycle. So, you know, the dropping comes out the back end um, and inside that uh, one chicken is the adults producing eggs. Uh, the dropping contaminates the environment. And then when another chicken sort of walks through it or pecks at the ground in the environment, they're picking up those eggs and the cycle continues. And the next one. All right, oh, we didn't have the indirect no, one? No, no, I don't know. Okay, well, the, in, the, the indirect one uh, is very similar, except you know the droppings go out and then they're either picked up directly by the bird, just like that one, or a snail or an earthworm comes by and picks up and is infected mm -hmm. that way. Okay, so I think the important thing is that like it's more than just uh, dropping and birds. Like it, you can clean up droppings and stuff, and that's gonna be we're gonna talk about sort of cleanliness of and, and hygiene and things like that. But um, it, you know when you're talking about worm control, there's a lot of stuff that's outside of just removing droppings from from the coop in order to control them. All right, with anybody so far, any questions uh, about those? Everyone probably knows those bird or those worms by now, but um, like the thing, like we were talking about gape worm a little bit, it is a lot more rare than we think uh, just because of the, um, mm -hmm. uh, when you see a bird who's having a hard time breathing and it has its mouth open, like that's a clinical sign of a lot of different conditions. A lot of things. <laughs> you know, so to say that, oh, it must have gape worm, uh, it, you know, it could be, uh, but it's also at least more likely that it isn't. Um, and so we'll talk about diagnosis and stuff, but there's a lot of factors that can go, that can be involved in diagnosing an actual Gape worm. And we've seen mainly gape worms this year in wild species. So we've done a few uh, caribou that have had those. Eh? Yeah. I'm, like, to be honest, I think I've only seen it a couple of times, like, and mm -hmm. had it diagnosed a couple of times in the thousands of birds that I've looked after. Yeah, and I'm yeah. pretty sure you've only seen it a few handful of times as well. Yeah. yeah. And the ones that we've seen, like the, the caribou and stuff, the wood pigeon that we saw, it has these blisters and the worms are sort of, and it's in the throat and the esophagus mm -hmm. and around it, it, like those little blisters can go all the way down the trachea 
and into the lungs. And it's just like those capillary worms, they hide from the immune system in there. Yeah. And you can see these little bubbles in there and you think, oh, it looks like a blister of some mm -hmm. sort with something in it. And it, the first time we saw it on the care room, it was quite confusing as to what it was. And even when we treated it, uh, we it took a very long time. Well, I don't even think we weren't even sure if we cleared it because it's such a it, the bubble that it creates. The body it can't break it. it down. Yeah. So the like the body is yeah protecting it from mm. the immune system. Um, so, and then we saw also the kingfisher. Sorry, yeah, we saw yeah. the kingfisher that had actual live ones in its mouth, and that took multiples. Horrible. So we have a couple of questions. Yeah, yeah, okay. I throw the bedding and poo from my chooks into my garden, which the hens have access to. I'm now thinking this isn't such a good idea. Uh, well, so bird droppings are a great uh, fertilizer. It's been one of the, they're one of the best ones. Um, in fact, on commercial farms, they use a lot of the composted bedding on pasture because of that. So I would suggest, in, you know, maybe instead of directly putting it onto your food for your birds to kind of get exposed to, uh, maybe putting it in a composter. Um, you know, you have to make sure you add a lot of carbon um, to the composter because the chicken poo, uh, the droppings are really high in nitrogen and they can be really high in phosphorus. And anybody who does any gardening will know if you have too much nitrogen in your compost, it tends to get really oozy and smelly. You get a very sort of uh, ammonia nitrogen smell off of it. Um, we often use what's called deep deep bedding composting um, on a lot of the farms that we work with and stuff. And that's just we take pine shavings and and we build that and we actually just leave it in there and it slowly composts itself uh, through bacteria and fungus into a pretty decent soil. Mm -hmm. And then that soil is it's alive really. It's like a yeah. Like a fermentation, I guess. <laughs> so uh, what are the signs that a chicken is sick with worms? So like sick with worms is like a bit of a bit of a an odd statement because like chickens can carry worms and carry them and be quite okay with the burden that they have. Yeah. It's when the burden gets out of control or if they're carrying a specific worm, like the one that carries a worm within a worm, yeah, yeah. That creates problems. That's right. Um the, those ones can do a lot of damage. Um, so, well, like there's a reason we haven't talked about clinical signs because diarrhea is typically what people get worried about when they start thinking their birds have worms and the, the gasping. So those are two real basic ones. But diarrhea can have again a lot of reasons, yeah. from uh, too much electrolytes to a, a change in diet to stress. Mm -hmm. Like you can get diarrhea for that. Um, and just like with respiratory gaping and stuff, like they could be hot, they could be stressed, uh, they could have a, a, a slight sinus infection and stuff too. All that can cause open mouth breathing as well. Mm -hmm. So the reason why we're not covering that is because it's a very general sign. And we'll go over some of the ways to diagnose it because uh, we think there are some available to you that you can do mm -hmm. um, that don't cost very much. But um, and even if you like, if you're waiting for clinical signs to happen to your bird before you do anything, it's probably already too late. Mm -hmm. They've probably produced thousands of eggs by that point, uh, which have been deposited into their range. And then you have to go and uh, find a way to sort of mitigate that over time. So it, it, it'll end up just building up in your yeah, coop. So it's better just to get on top of it. And we will talk about more ways of how you kind of keep on top of yeah, it. Yeah as well um deep litter method can you do it on a wooden floor if your coop is made of wood uh well yeah you can so a lot of the woods we have are pressure treated especially um the laminates and stuff they're pressure treated um we have areas where the walls are plywood and stuff too and we'll compost in there w without any issue um you know, obviously that's finite. You, your floor is not going to last forever, but you can you can still do it. Um, yeah, a, a container like a container is a container. You can compost in almost anything. Really. Yeah. So the important thing is remove it when it's too wet, or study a little bit about what makes good compost, and you'll realize you'll have to sort of add carbon yeah, yeah. to it as it goes. Yeah. yeah. Does the composting process kill eggs? Will they uh, drown in worm farm liquid? Yeah, well, <laughs> so a lot of things kill eggs. 
Um, but yeah, they do get parasitized by things like mites, uh, other bacteria. They do have a shelf life, okay? So they're not, um, they're not, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Indestructible, yeah. Invincible. Yeah, so there will be a degradation of them over time. And composting is a great way to sort of do that naturally in a way that's, especially in an area that has a high concentration of them. Mm. Um, and just by doing that too, you dilute it out. So a compost is actually alive with a lot of other organisms, uh, insects and uh, fungus and stuff. And all that adds to the dilution effect of it. Yeah. All right, protozoa. Okay. We've had enough time to look at this slide. You sure we don't want to kill, talk about that? <laughs> All right. Okay, so we're, we'll probably spend a bit of time on coccidiosis, but we can also we'll, we'll cover some warming regimes, and if there's more questions, we can do larger questions near the end too. Okay. Um, all right. Coccidiosis or coxy. I, I put the coxy in there because I remember some lady saying that's not an appropriate. Um, uh, short, short, shorthand for coccidiosis, but as somebody who uses it a lot, I took offense to that. But <laughs> so co coxy can also be cocci, which is a, a type of bacteria shape, um, and she thought that was confusing. It can be, but it's all context. Yeah, it's a context. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> coccidiosis, you can see on the the picture there. Uh, these are what are called oocysts. And oocysts uh, that are look like this are isolated out in what's called a fecal uh, egg count. Um, and you can count these up. We've done, I've done experiments where you look at these on a regular basis to see how these protozoas are sort of uh, infecting birds and how they're going through their life cycle and um, you know where the peaks are and stuff. So they have a bit of a interesting life cycle, which we'll, we'll talk about a bit. But each species has its own strain of coccidia and they don't infect other species. So if you have turkeys and chickens, they'll have separate cocci that affect them mm -hmm. and neither of them will affect the other bird. So you're dealing with completely different uh, problems in each species. So if you have a peahen versus a chicken or a parrot versus, uh, they'll, they'll all be different species, slightly different. Um, and it's universally present where chickens live. Uh, it's one of those ones that's near impossible to remove cleaning wise, uh, like inside a coop, even after you disinfect it, it's probably still covered in oocysts. Uh, you know, the only time we, we never have a problem with it is when you bringing chickens onto a new site where no other chicken has lived before. Mm -hmm. Other than that, chances are they're going to pick it up. Okay. Um, and that's due to the high number of oocysts uh, in the shed or in the coop um, and the resistance to chemicals. It, detergents don't destroy them. Uh, disinfectants, they have a hard time with it. Um, so really the only way to get them out is just making sure you get them out as much organic material out as you can. And then just, you're trying to rely on the chemicals and stuff for the last little bit. Time is a good thing too. Like if you can put a lot of time into or space it out before putting in new birds, uh, it can help prevent it. Yeah, oh, hand. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, they have a, a direct life cycle. So the oocysts, um, they have a real complex life cycle in the bird. They go through a bunch of different uh, asexual and sexual reproductive phases. And they have weird names like shizons and stuff like that. If you have a look online, the picture is amazing. And those, all those are happening at once inside the intestine. So they, these little guys, they sort of um, uh, insert themselves into intestinal cells and then divide asexually or, se or sexually in there and produce offsprings that go and do the next phase of the life cycle in other cells adjacent to them and stuff like that. And they go through this sort of phase and it takes about seven to 10 days on average uh, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on the species, for them to do this. And so you, in an infection with coccidiosis, you'll see multiple sort of peaks where they go through clinical signs. Sometimes it's every seven days, sometimes it's every 10 days. And depending on the species, it'll have a, it'll have a, a, a peak infectious period where there's the most organisms infecting those intestines. And if you have a lot of them, that's when you start to see like clinical signs of coccidiosis, okay? So 
you know, weather and ingestion, depending on how many they eat, all depends or all can infect how, how that infection goes. Um, and then once ingested, the different strains infect different locations in the intestine. So if you do a postmortem, you can guess uh, just based on what you see, what species it is mm -hmm. in there and sort of categorize it. Um, and some of them, depending on which species it is, will have weird damage. So some are really innocuous. They just infect like the tip of the villi and then that shed off and, uh, you know, there's almost no damage or no irritation to the bird. With others, are they, they replicate deep in the tissue. And when they sort of emerge, they cause a lot of damage, which then becomes infected from bacteria and stuff too. Do we have any questions? Hmm. Just ones about uh, worms and if they get damaged by sun. Worm eggs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So UV is one of the big ones that you can use to kill off worm eggs for sure. Coccidiosis as well. Um, you know, something that's warm and dry is a, is a great way to sort of uh, kill it off. The, the sun is a, almost a natural disinfectant. Can you compost chicken poo that has worms and protozoa? Yeah, 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 you can. So like these things are everywhere. And it, like uh, sparrows have coccidiosis, uh, mm -hmm. sparrows have worms, eggs, they, they have all that. So the soil is literally a, the biggest jungle of life that you can think of. <laughs> And composting it just turns that into something else. So you can actually increase the biodiversity in that piece of soil that you're creating. And that either kills off, ingests, or neutralizes some of those eggs and stuff. But it won't get them all. It won't get them all. No, uh, you can't. All of these sort of parasites, none of them are transferable to any humans or pets or anything like that. So all of these are bird specific, okay? Um, they will have similar species like the, the, uh, the ascarids. They'll have s each animal, like humans will have their own version of that worm. Um, and they do have them. The dogs have their own versions, like pigs have their own versions. And they don't tend to be infectious to, the, to other species. Yeah. So yeah, but saying that you gotta wonder evolutionary, how did they get there in the first place? Mm. So I'm sure we're probably missing a, <laughs> an ecological step, but my advice would still be, you know, hygiene and cleaning, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Wash your hands, yeah, you know, it's important. It's important. So here's a, a great example where, you know, we're stealing a few pictures offline here, but I thought this was a great one. Um, so in here, you can see like the, the picture on the left I'm looking at, um, the, the, the row of them on the top is the different um, oocysts that you see that are coming out in the droppings. And you can see they're different sizes and they have a slightly different shape. And then below that, for each of those species, these are just chicken coccidia. Below that are the intestine. And so the top, the little round thing at the top is the gizzard. And then the squiggly bit in the middle is sort of the uh, intestine. And then down the bottom, that little forked bit, those are the cica. And then the really sort of bottom part is the, uh, the rectum or the part that goes out towards the cloaca. And so you can see A. cervulina tends to be the near the top. And it's a very light infection for the most part. And then you go down to one like tenella. Tenella is predominantly just in the cica. And this, is, this one um, infects really deep in that tissue. And when it emerges, it can cause a lot of bleeding. So most likely if you're seeing blood in the droppings or digested blood in the droppings, it's probably from one like this. Mm -hmm. And then the, the necatrix is kind of all over, but it's also equally um, uh, destructive to the intestine because of where it infects. And then on the right, you can see the bird uh, that's your classical. It's real classic of coxie. Con, that's a sick bird look. Yeah, <laughs> that's a really sick bird look to be fair. But I mean, if you're seeing anything where the bird is looking fluffed up, tail down, like if you're seeing liquid droppings like coming out the back, like closing their eyes more often than not, yeah. even that slight like squinting, it's not good. So especially if the movement isn't good, they're not moving around their usual selves or they're not eating as much as they usually would. These are all like 
great signs that uh, you need to kind of act quickly yeah. um, when well, it comes to their health. Yeah, yeah. And so this is where like sick bird look, it's used a lot. Um, you know, you'll see a lot of pictures like this on Facebook and things like that, uh, asking what's going on. Pretty much all you can really say is it's a sick bird. Uh, and to get the actual sort of answer, you'll have to run a little bit of diagnosis. One of them is the fecal egg count. Um, you know, you can differentiate between all these worms and the coccidiosis on this, but I'll, I'll talk about that near the end. So is coxy more common in younger hens or can it affect older hens too? Oh, good. Uh, that's a, yeah, that's uh, a great question. Actually, I think, uh, yeah. So we're going to talk about immunity. All right. So normally coxy is for younger birds. Um, when you see disease, it tends to be the young ones. Uh, that's because they don't have an immunity to it. Immunity isn't passed on um, by a maternal antibodies. In this case, they have to develop it. And because Coxy is so ubiquitous on the floor or in the coop on their mother, um, it becomes really uh, an important part of their development when they're young. Uh, and so you see Coxy infect the bird and it goes through these sort of phases, seven to 10 days where the different species, those five or six different species that we saw are all replicating in there. And our job is to sort of make sure that that bird has what it needs to um, fight off a big infection. Mm -hmm. So if it gets a large whopping dose of all of those, it's going to be really challenged to, to, to recover from that. But the immune system will be working overtime to try and prevent it. Um, so when we see like a clinical outbreak of diarrhea or there's a whole bunch of birds that all of a sudden uh, have that sick bird look um, and we suspect coxie, we take some fecal uh, samples, we run it and we see, oh, okay, we have a big coxie sort of uh, outbreak and we treat. The idea of treating is not to remove all that coxie, especially when they're young, but to minimize how much it's causing damage. And we do that by minimizing how many are actually replicating in the in the system. But to maintain immunity to it as it gets older, let's say it, it survives the initial sort of infection stage to maintain immunity, it needs a constant exposure over time. So it the coxie has to kind of be in there continuously in a very small amount. And that immune system will always kind of be triggered to keep it at bay. And so what happens in older birds uh, if they become immune compromised for whatever reason, like coming into lay um, the middle of winter, a cold snap, a hot, you know, hot heat wave, um, a stress event, getting chased or, or bit by a dog or another infection of something that where their immune system is challenged. If they're immune compromised and they pick up a, a coccidiosis, they could go through another challenge of it then while they're older. So it is possible for older birds to get it. Yeah. 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 Birds, I mean, birds tend to like never be suffering from one thing <laughs> because like the way that their immune system kind of functions when it gets hit, like everything can kind of come out. And a lot of the times birds are just constantly battling a number, like a number of issues like at once. So like yeah. if you're looking at worms and coxie and external just, parasites, yeah, external parasites, viruses, viruses yeah. like they're constantly battling those things. So like when the immune system gets knocked, you have to remember that all of those things are like, you know, handing on the door. Yeah. So it's easy for them to all like kind of come in at once. So when we see sick birds, it's more often than not that they are suffering from multiple things. Yeah. The, the other thing for older birds when they catch coxie is, is moving them to a, a new property where there was birds previously. Um, often, sometimes uh, we can, like, birds can happily live without coxie. Like, so you can clean up an environment and remove the, the high coxie challenge, and that bird will continue to function and live. But the immunity to coxie will disappear. So they won't have any ability to sort of... Um, to fight it off. So what happens then, you move them to another flock, let's say, but in their old place or where they were living before, they didn't have that same sort of uh, exposure to coccidiosis. So their immune system started to wane. You bring them onto a new property, all of a sudden they get a big whack dose of it and you can start the whole process of gaining immunity again. So the immunity is not for life. They have to 
constantly have a little bit of it to, to keep it going. So that, that brings us into this control aspect here. So there's a couple different ways we can control it. Um, the first one is we've got two different chemicals and people oftentimes use these ones interchangeably depending on when you can get it. Uh, from my experience, it's actually probably better to use one in certain times and then the other one in other times. So Baycox is a cytal. So it's coccidal. It will kill all the coccidia it comes across. Um, and it, it will eliminate it. If you do for a few days, it will eliminate it completely from the bird. You can wipe out every single coccidia in there. Mm -hmm. um, and if you do that enough times and then you put it back into an environment that's really clean, you have that same problem of next time they get exposed to it, your immune system has to kick back in and you can run through that, this whole sort of infective phase again, okay? Um, Coxyprol, which is a, a, a coxystatic medication, all that really does is prevent it from replicating in the intestine. So it doesn't kill them, but it prevents just them. Just slows them down. Just slows them down. And when, you, when your infection isn't that bad, like if it's just a normal sort of, oh, you know, it's a new bird or it's immune suppressed and it's catching a little bit, it's still eating, but it doesn't look happy. You know, this one is one of those ones that just takes the edge off and allows that immune system to do the rest. So as long as you're giving it like supportive care, heat and stuff like that, which is two of the things we recommend with coxie challenges, yeah. supportive care and heat, it, it, they tend to pull through without any problems. Yeah. Really. Another thing I will mention is that when they're suffering from a fairly like large challenge of this, I mean, even a mild challenge, it can be quite painful. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it's wreaking havoc on the intestinal tract and making it fairly raw and inflamed. So infected almost, yeah, it's, it's horrible. So like, I mean, pain relief is really important during these times. If you think they're really like, it's a pretty gnarly infection, you definitely want to get on board with some pain relief. I mean, I will throw pain relief at a bird even if yeah. I think it's like a small infection, because I know like a, a sore digestive tract is a sore digestive yeah, tract. Yeah, that's, that's a great actually. Yeah, thing. but like another thing also to remember is like when you are looking after them, bringing them inside, doing the sort of um, supportive care regime, like birds are a bit sore, tend to want to go towards softer foods as well. So that's like a, another important thing to remember if you've got a patient inside. Offer them soft foods uh, just is a lot easier on the digestive tract. Yep. It might stimulate them to eat a little bit better than being given solid pellets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got a good question. So for chicks, it is it true some chick starter has a coccidia stat that can cancel the effects of coxiprol or Baycox um, or that can cancel the effects of coxie? So Baycox should be used instead. Okay, so my last point, but I have another because I do that. Uh, ionophores like menensin. So that's what's called um, ionophore or a coccidiostat. Menensin, there's a few different uh, chemicals that are used. They're only used uh, for coccidiosis. Um, they're not used in humans or anything like that. Uh, these are ten, tend to be formulated into pellets. So commercial farms will do this, but you can buy these for yeah your chick crumble starter type stuff. Mm -hmm. And what that does is um, it, it does control the, it's cytal, so it does control the, um, the coccidia by killing them. But they also, what they're, they're called leaky chemicals, so they don't do all of the, they don't kill all the coccy. So like Baycox is one of those ones, it just lights a fire and kills everything. These other ones, they'll, they're less, they're more selective. They'll kill a few, but there's a bunch that live. And so it lowers the population, but you get just a few sort of leaking out the back end. And what that does is prevent these sort of giant sort of infections from happening. So you don't get a lot of clinical signs, but they can develop their immunity because there's a little bit coming through, right? So you still get the cycling and you still get the immunity. So things like menensin, they will let a few coxie survive. It's not on purpose. It's just the way the chemical works. Um, and those tend to reinfect the bird. And so your challenge ends up being quite low over time. Mm -hmm. So it is a good one. You don't want too much of it in there because you can eliminate it. 
And then when you go on to a food without it, they can go through a challenge later on in their life. So if you do too many chemicals, like if you think you can use Coxyprol from day old to six weeks instead, um, like continuously, you'll just push your, your infection and, and all the sort of, you know, disease processes till when you stop. That's it. Like they need that exposure. You, the whole idea about controlling coxy is just about minimizing how much coxy they have, not about eliminating it. I hope that answers that question. I may have just made it more complicated. I don't know. <laughs> All right, histaminiasis. So we touched on this one a little bit when we were talking about worms. This is the worm within a worm or parasite in a worm in a worm. Is that your inception? Uh, wormception. Wormception. <laughs> it's a dangerous word. Uh, this protozoa is a parasite of the heterachus or the cecal worm. So these little worms are tiny, like the, the head of a pin. Like they're real hard to see. Uh, even when they're alive, when we do a postmortem, they're real hard to see. So, but once this worm infects the chicken, this protozoa emerges and then it gets absorbed through the, the intestine into the uh, cardiovascular system, into the, the veins and the arteries. And it starts to infect like the liver, the, the kidneys, sometimes the spleen and stuff. You can, they can all of a sudden become uh, quite dispersed through the body. Um, and you get these things like the, the, the picture on the top is a postmortem on a chicken uh, with histaminiasis. And you get these sort of little bullseye lesions. These are pathognomonic, which means uh, this lesion is only created by this organism. So if you, uh, for whatever reason, see this on a liver, uh, you can almost guarantee that they're, they're having a... It's what you got. Yeah, you've got this <laughs> protozoa. And then the, the picture on the bottom is where these, so these are sequel worms that bring this protozoa in. And on the bottom, you can see like the, the sort of cottage cheesy type texture in there. And what happens is it, there becomes a big sort of inflammatory reaction in the cica and they develop like, it's, it's kind of like a hard pus uh, concretion. You get these weird sort of, uh, we call them sausages in there. And they're just, that's just damage to the cica. They become quite, uh, unusable, um, and the chicken gets a lot of secondary bacteria and stuff too. So the di diagnosis on these is really underreported in a lot of birds because the only really way to diagnose it is by doing postmortem and seeing these lesions. So in a in a live bird, it you know oftentimes if you have heterachus come up in a fecal egg count or something like that, or or a vet diagnoses heterachus infection chances are you probably have this on top of it, okay? So, and then if you treat for worms, uh, it's good. You can remove that. But if this infection has kind of gotten out in the meantime, uh, you will kind of have it in the background. It's not 100%, but it's a good chance that that could be infecting. And you see all sorts of weird clinical signs from polyuria, which is lots of urine, to... Uh, liver issues, you know, uh, very weird droppings. We see a lot of sort of uh, yellow. Get some weird colors cream in the face. color. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that's I mean, the other. That's, why... <laughs> that's why it's called black. That, that, that's a good. Yeah. So they get cardiovascular issues. So like that real darkened kind of face. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So and that's usually from liver things. Yeah. So treatment for that is available, and again, that's like an antibiotic treatment. Yeah, well, very specific, uh, um, very specific. Fam family of antibiotics. So uh, they don't, like in the US and stuff, the, the things like um, uh, metronidazole or dimetrazole and stuff, they, they've all been sort of banned for that in food producing animals, just because it has, um, it has some serious sort of side effects to the bird and stuff. And they think they're, well, the science suggests that there's some issues with liver and maybe the carcass and stuff where it doesn't remove that. But if you're, yeah, if you're following the withhold periods and stuff, you're usually pretty good. So, and we default to very big withhold periods, which we will get to. All right. Uh, we can't talk about these internal parasites without talking about resistance. So we've talked about this with mites. You know, how, uh, yeah. how many mites uh, become resistant to all the sort of chemicals we use on them and stuff. Worms and protozoas are no different. 
So resistance is when a treatment such as a worming agent, so let's say levamazole, starts to become less effective uh, on that target organism, right? So it's killing those organisms less over time. And that's because what happens is the survivor of those treatments usually have an adaption that enables them to survive. And then they just breed a whole bunch of other strong adaptive. Yeah, yeah. My, my <laughs> sentence here is great. I, I guess I didn't proofread this one, but have, <laughs> have adaptions that, uh, that enable the parasite to adapt is a really redundant statement, by the way. <laughs> this can be so, but these adaptions can be behavioral. So like some of these worms that bury themselves in the tissue or create these little spaces where the immune system can't get them. You know, that's that's where these things kind of evolved from. They're, they're ways of that, that organism uh, allows them to survive. So yeah, the survivors replicate and that trait is passed on to their progeny. And then it becomes much more prevalent uh, the more you treat. So the more pressure you put on them, the more likely those worms will develop resistance or those those pests will de develop resistance. So that's why I, like uh, when we talk, so you, you end up in this chemical biological arms race. So you know, the, we have to develop better chemicals to kill these worms because the worms are becoming resistant. So we have to invest more money or techniques on how to sort of manage them and stuff. But realistically, and we'll get to some of the, the stuff, but it's more about uh, managing it than it is eliminating it. So, and that's why we always recommend those fecal egg counts, you know, have a look, see what's wrong. Don't treat if you don't have to. You know, if you know what worms you've got, you can use the correct active for those worms, which is awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's real helpful. Eh? All right, and then we can't get into to the use of these chemicals without talking about this because this I'm not sure if it's a bugbear for me, but it is. It's it's something that a lot of people don't really consider, and it's important to know why we're using these things the way they are. Okay, so we're going to talk first about on label. Okay, so on label means uh, the use of this means that the product has been approved for use in the desired species for a very specific or very specific category of treatment. Okay, so there's a lot of evaluation that goes into the research behind it. It goes into, uh, you know, how fast a drug is eliminated, how toxic is it, is it environmentally friendly, you know, will it cause issues to food safety or to humans? You know, like, you know, if you get well, have weird side effects yeah, on, yeah. Your, on your bird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, uh, you know, prostaglandins and stuff like that. Like, there's a whole bunch of chemicals, not to say that we're going to use any of those, but there's a whole bunch of side effects of some of these chemicals sometimes. And to be able to go through those and really have a good idea of when to use it, how to protect yourself, you know, all goes into the label. So when you have a label that's assigned by the, the MPI or, you know, the ACVM, uh, the, the yeah, Agricultural Chemical and Veterinary Medicine Group, they, yeah, they're the ones that come up with the, approve the labels. So they tell you what the withhold period is are for meat and eggs and they, you, you know, what animals you can use it on, what the dose rates are, and they make sure that it's safe for you to use on your animals and for you really. And each country evaluates their products in the own way, which is why the products from one country to the other have different labels. Okay, an off label means you're using a chemical or drug. Uh, it can be used by a veterinarian, but it's in some way that isn't indicated on the label. So you're using, either using a, uh, yeah, so it can be changed in a number of ways, like what species you're using it on, what concentration you're using. So you can use, be using a higher dose, uh, what route. So either, you know, orally, or is it going, you know, subcutaneously? Is it getting sprayed on the wall? You know, um, so when you're using a chemical where the label doesn't say specifically for a bird on it, you're technically using that chemical off label. Now it may be used uh, it may be on label in other countries and they use it quite regularly for that, but there's a cost for getting a label. So the company who produces that has to pay the government to look over all their data to get the label. It's very expensive. That's why in New Zealand, we don't have very many registered uh, medications for birds specifically. It's yeah. just that the we don't have enough of them really which is weird because we're a bird country, yeah. but like there's not enough people to advocate and kind of 
get these products into the country, get them registered, and then pay up the money that it costs to, yeah. to go through the process. It's just, it's insane. So even some of the veterinary drugs will be specific for dogs or cats because they don't want to go through the process of evaluating what it is for a chicken or food safety. Yeah. And then even some of the ones for birds are for like pet birds, uh, you know, and not for chickens particularly because chickens are considered a food producing animal. Like, so it's different from a parrot or a pigeon to a chicken. Yeah. So that's why the labels sometimes are difficult and why we get a bit frustrated with our sort of range of products. Um, saying that anything that's used off label, so this is any agricultural chemical or medication that doesn't say that you can actually use it on a bird has a default withhold period of 10 days for eggs and 63 days for meat. Okay, so that's that's a standard. That's a standard. Yeah, you can't get away from that one. Um, the only time you can get away from that is if a veterinarian has prescribed you this chemical off label and they have really good evidence to suggest that they can change those. Mm -hmm. So you got to back yourself up with science. I can't just say, okay, no withhold on that one. Here's a prescription, go ahead. Like I'm liable for that as a veterinarian. So yeah. So when you see these people who are selling off-label chemicals and stuff, uh, if something does go wrong, uh, there's no liability there. Like yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they don't usually have a license to... Here, well, we'll go on to our next one, I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. No, we're, 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 not. Back, we're talking we're... about that in a bit. Okay. But like, yeah, another thing to remember is that when you're, when you're looking at these withhold days, uh, one that we see quite often is the 10 days egg withhold. And people are like, if I can't eat the eggs, then I'll just feed them back to my chickens. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. <laughs> because you're just putting a, like, a lower concentration back into them and you're actually extending out your uh, days of withhold as well. So yeah. it's best just to scrap them, which is sad. But... Yes, unfortunately. All right, so we're just going to go through some of the on-label products for um, that are registered in New Zealand. It's a very short list. Yes. So. <laughs> All right, everybody's favorite. Uh, Aviverm. It's Levamazole is the active. So Aviverm is the, the trade brand. name, the brand. And Levamazole is actually what you're giving your chicken. Okay. And so there'll be other brands that use Levamazole as well. So this one has a six day egg and seven day meat withhold. It's 96% effective against most roundworms. That's the latest paper I could find on it. So that means you've got 4% of those worms who aren't still dying. Still hanging around. Still hanging around. Multiple treatment does improve that, but again, you, you're still dealing with a, um, a margin of error. Uh, and then it has difficulty killing the juvenile capillaria. So if you remember from earlier, the capillaria buries itself into the intestine, into these little nodules. This aviverm will not kill those in there, okay? Because you tend to do a one-day treatment anyways. And capillaria can sort of manifest itself yeah. over days and days. Yeah, when picking a worm, I mean, we're going to go through a bunch of them here. Um, there's upsides and downsides to all of them. Yeah, yeah. So I guess you just have to work out kind of what works for you. Uh, this is why, again, we recommend fecal egg counts, and knowing exactly what you're up against, because it means it makes your choices a little bit easier. Yeah. And so, again, this one does not have great effect against tapeworms. So if you have tapeworms in your uh, property or on your birds, um, while this is good, it's it's probably not getting rid of those. Everyone's favorite. Yeah, flubanol. <laughs> uh, the active ingredient there is flubendazole. Um, it's an in-feed treatment. So it's actually supposed to be in the pellet, yeah. right? Um, so with the withhold varies with the concentration. So the... The, the normal prophylactic one, it, and this is where it gets kind of ridiculous, it's 30 grams per 1,000 kgs of feed, okay? I don't know how many of you have ever mixed that many grams into that much feed before, but yeah. it is ridiculous. It's a small, small <laughs> amount. So it means your mixing system has to be quite good. Yeah. And that's the only concentration, on, if you read the label, that's the only concentration on that label that has nil egg, and meat withhold. It says later on the label that if you go up to the 60 gram per 1,000 kgs, which kills tapeworm, that there that they actually had go silent on the withhold. So when they when they don't tell you what the withhold is at the other one, you go to the default withhold. 
Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's it's not you know three days or five days. You don't get to make it up. It goes to the standard ten days egg withhold. Okay. And then if you read further down on the label for the flubanol, the direction actually states that it's unadvisable to sort of sprinkle the powder on top of the pellets or crumb because of the non-homogeneous mixing rate. Yeah. You know, so they, they're even warning you on the label to be careful how it's applied. And for us, in terms of, um, you know, clients that we've had to, to talk to you about, yeah. And farms that we've been on too, they've yeah. had issues with this one, not because of the mixing ratio, not working as well as they would have liked. And there's a lot of refractory yeah. worm bird. We, we always suggest, I mean, we totally understand why you'd use flubanol because of the nil egg withhold, if you're able to do your, and let's be honest, it'd be more like three grams into like a hundred kgs, which is pretty minimal. Yeah, that's um, tiny. That's a tiny amount. It's like sprinkling on there. Like... I get like the the want for a nil egg withhold, but if you are going to use this product, I strongly recommend that you get a fecal egg count done after you've used it just to make sure it actually did its job. Because yeah, as Sam said, we the amount of people that we know that use this product and we've we've got them a fecal egg count after the fact. Yeah most of them come back still with worms. It's it's actually kind of crazy. Yeah, the hit rate's still it's, really high. It's really high. So just check. It's always better to check. Yeah. And you, like, if you look, that's 600 gram bucket. I know they come in like 200 gram ones, but still you're looking at three grams per hundred. Like you're using that for the rest of the, you know, maybe five years of food sometimes. <laughs> I think we have a question in the chat. I've found this to be unreliable as they are free ranging. You're not certain how much they're eating. Unfortunately, this didn't red tape worm for us, even with numerous repeats due to yeah. the closed garden. Yeah, that's essentially the same complaint we get. So, well, lot. yeah, it is. The reason being, sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you, but the reason being is because like the dose rate is so important for any of these ones. Yeah, it's hard to make that much powder stick to that many pellets. Like it really is. Even yeah. if you coat them, spritz of them with a little bit of like oil or something to try to get it on there, like it's really like, there are commercial mixes that kind of mix powders and things. Yeah. And then you're just like, you're trying to do this job of mixing a powder into a pellet, which is, it's crazy. Like it's, yeah. it just, it seems impossible to me. But these worm treatments, if you don't want to develop resistance and you actually want them to be effective, the dose rate is very important, right? Yeah. So if you're going to sort of go off label and you, I we, like we just said, look, look how effective it is. Yeah. Make sure that your program is working. For and you. We, we do get this a lot where people say, like, I've been using flubanol this whole time and I've never had a worm problem, yeah. but they haven't actually checked. Yeah. So like just because you don't see them in the droppings doesn't mean they're not there like often they are microscopic I mean as we said before there's only a couple of varieties there that you actually see whereas there's quite a few others that you will not see like yeah. they're just too small so it's better to check that you like definitely don't have a worm problem rather than just winging it and hoping for the best yeah I mean you heard the descriptions of those things. Like, do you really want them living in your birds? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. It sounded horrible. You don't want yeah, your yeah. poor little chuckers like having them all crawling in their tummies. Yeah, yeah. It, but it, it, like saying that, it is a good product. And if you can, if you are checking and it's working, that's awesome. We're just trying to point out that there are risks if you're not looking. Okay. <clears throat> All right, the off-label products. <laughs> so that was two products. That, that, was our two, that was two products that you get to choose from. So these are all the off-label products. As Sam said, like most of these are either not registered here and need veterinary like scripting. Um, yeah, no, that's, oh, that's, just that's it. They that's need it. veterinary scripting. So yeah, okay. So this is a new one that we brought in um, just because of the nil egg withhold. We know it's an attractive number for a lot of people, okay. Um, this, are, one, this one's a little bit more interesting in the fact that it's water soluble though. So you're yeah. not guessworking at the dilution rate so much. Now yeah. this one isn't registered in this country. Yeah. So this one, you can only use it under prescription from us. All right. Um, well, 
Well, no, it's only from us. We don't sell yeah. this to everybody else. Um, it's effective on roundworms only. So, uh, you know, I would say capillaria is probably one of those ones that it can do. Uh, Heterachis, um, ascarids, those type of things, not flatworms, none of, none of those, um, uh, you know, uh, gape worm type yeah. ones at all. Um, that's the only, and because it has really good evidence overseas of nil egg withhold, that's why I'm comfortable prescribing that as a, an egg withhold. So it's got your nil egg withhold, it just lacks. But it's, again, it's only specific to yeah. those roundworms. So if you yeah. do a fecal egg count and you've got other things in there, it's um, not going to do it. Is piperazine bitter like abiverm? Oh, I don't, like, to be honest, I haven't tried myself. <laughs> Um, they're all bitter. they're all bitter like yeah. these medications are all bitter like I've read that people have said that their birds prefer this one over avivirm but like to be honest I, I I really struggle to believe that one's more bitter than the other I assume they're both as horrible as each other yeah yeah like yuck chemicals it's in that uh, pyrazine <laughs> I think is in the ivermectin family so yeah. it would be very similar to that sort of thing yeah all right this one is technically for birds, but for not birds. for chickens. Yeah, so if you read it, it's more for ornamental cage birds, uh, which are your parrots and, and smaller ones. Finches. So technically, if you buy this one over the counter, it's for those birds only. Um, this is a liquid one. You can find it's everywhere. Uh, yep. And we still, we, I, we, I pronounce it differently than you do. Yeah, vitrol. I say a vitrol, but that's my. We uh, only just got corrected on this recently, <laughs> and it makes a lot of sense. Went, like, yeah. Avian, avitrol, avian, avian and control. we were like, oh, oh. <laughs> click, click. Yeah. Like we should know that given our name. <laughs> well, whatever. We, I think I looked sideways. I, I, yeah, I we knew, knew that. that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this water treatment is available in New Zealand, and you can buy it almost everywhere. The downside is the lick because it is made for ornamental cage little birds like the dilution rate of it is like you're not going to get much out of this bottle essentially yeah. i think one bottle does like two chips two, two, yeah two chips. they're not even big i don't chips. even think it's going to do the double dosing of those two chips yeah. either but like it's and like for its price it's not the most cost effective wormer no. but it does you for a lot of worms because it's got two actives in it yeah. so it's got the levamazole and the positive yeah so you get the the double whammy levamazole's got a great sort of spectrum of what it can deal with and you've got the prosequanto that takes care of tapering yeah now but this yeah. yeah this one does have the 10 day egg withhold which is the standard yeah. um we do import a pill form of this one yeah. which is not fantastic like good for really tiny chooks and great for pigeons like but again they they are dosed for smaller birds so yeah. those are available So oxfendazole and fenbendazole, they're in the same family. They have a very similar way of working. They, they'll be off the shelf products for other animals. So you can find these actives in a uh, over-the-counter veterinary clinic. Uh, you, you know, again, they're not for birds, they're for ruminants. Like most of the wormers we have in this country are for ruminants. Um, they're very effective. So both of these ones are very effective. I think one of them is Panicure, the other one's a Bonatech or something like that. There's a few different variants of them. Anyways, they're very effective against a whole lot of stuff, including tapeworms. They're very good against the, the gape worms and stuff too. Um, you know, so they're great. Most of them are liquid though. Uh, so you have the same problem as your ivermectin and things like that. Uh, it's a little bit in a large amount of water, bitter taste yada 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 and we do also bring this one in um as a, a tablet as well i like these ones a lot yeah <laughs> i mean pilling a bird like if you're comfortable doing that awesome one of these tablets does two kgs of bird which is like kind of perfect so it just means one tablet now one tablet in like 10 to 14 days yeah and like, to me, that seems really easy because it means that you have guaranteed that you've gotten the right amount of medication into said bird, yeah. which is fantastic. <laughs> you don't have to guess. I mean, again, like not the cheapest of wormers, like tablets still are like a couple of bucks a piece, but like, at least you've got guaranteed kind of dosing. You, you say that. like I say that, but. A like, couple bucks a piece, but if you go look at a dog wormer or a cat wormer, 
like how much of those each true true you know? like yeah the, um you can buy the tablets from us just send us an email um yeah. and we can help you out uh we've got a question here about piperzine yeah. and av verm and if you can dose them orally um as oh, individual birds yeah the mixing ratio is pretty so the piperzine is um uh, it's quite nine mils to 1.1 liter of water. So that dose rate is. You're getting like, I think it was almost like two mil a bird to do that one. Whereas the AV verm, I think is quite minimal. I don't personally like putting those liquids yeah. down birds mouths because unless I'm mixing them in with some water, mainly because the, yeah, you can. They get, can be quite acrid. They There's, can be quite acrid, and you can like you can like upset the esophagus. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, you can do it. Um, it's not my preferred method. I know why you want to do those ones, yep. um, but there are some risks to it. Um, you know, uh, inhalation of it aside, there are a few little risks to it in terms of how much concentration you're giving and all at once type thing. It's not, most of them have a fairly good safety margin. Uh, Levamazole, maybe not as much. Um, Piperzine, maybe a little bit better. Um, yeah, so I think it's just about dose. We can definitely do something about, we could probably write a little something about how to dose those individually and maybe the safest yeah. way to do that. Yeah, because I think if you do add a bit of water into it and if you are comfortable dosing like a bird with a syringe in water, then then cool, go go for gold. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it, it can, it does have its risks. So uh, is worm out effective against capillaria? Yes, uh, it's all it's all the all the worms. Yeah, this one's like, against. I mean, doesn't have the egg, like I find that the, this is like that triangle. You it can't is. you can't have all three. You Almost. don't get you don't get the egg withhold. <laughs> it's kind of pricey, but it does you for everything. Yeah. And if you're going to use this, like if you're going to use a warm out tablet for capillaria, you're going to do two or three days in a row because you're going to want to get rid of all those juveniles that are hatching to minimize how much you have in there. So often, like in horses, when we use uh, oxfentazole or moxidectin for capillaria, we do like a five day treatment to, to clear them all up. In, in chooks, you can do five days, but three days is, is pretty good. And then you're repeating it again in three days. So at what was it two dollars a tablet type Something thing like you know you're looking at six twelve bucks for the the two treatments so it's it's kind of pricey for a larger flock yeah. all right moxidectin this is a off-label one again um there is a oral treatment and or an injectable treatment for cattle and sheep the you want the injectable one because all the oral ones come with uh minerals selenium and those will definitely be toxic yep. to your birds at those concentrations. Okay, you don't want those in there. Um, so you, if you are going to get it, ask the vets for the injectable versions. Uh, they're oral treatments. When you use them on the birds, you can dose these. Moxidectin especially is okay to dose um, directly into the bird without any dilution rate. Okay. Um, all these kind of uh, the cydectin, the moxidectin, this family of drugs is really quite good. It has a lot of effect against intestinal worms, including tapeworms. It's a really good one for capillaria. It is the go-to one for capillaria if you have them. Yeah. The one thing we will say about like this one particularly, or just anyone like, sometimes these get used like on the skin. Oh, you want to talk about dosing of skin? Yeah, 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 dosing on skin. So there are a few like worming products that do get dosed on the skin. Yeah. We don't recommend it. There is like, there is evidence it does something, but like I think you're not going to get the most um, efficacy. Efficacy putting it on the skin. So if with all these worming treatments, always we always recommend orally. I mean, it's going there, so you might as well put it. Yeah, there, there are a lot of good papers about on the skin treatments. And for some of these ones, like ivermectin, which I didn't include in this list, um, <laughs> it's Friday. <laughs> um, but I, ivermectin is in the sort of moxidectin family. I would, I would pick moxidectin over ivermectin any day of the week, uh, just because of the toxicity levels and stuff is a little bit better. Um, and its effect against capillaria. Um, 
but yeah, on the skin, there is a lot of research that is, is getting better and better. I think if, unless you are looking at your bird, like there's no, there's no studies that suggest it's a hundred percent effective. It's just saying that it is effective to some extent. So well, I don't know what that is on half the time, 60%, 80%, you know, um, and it's hard to tell unless you're checking. So if you want to do it like that and just put it on the bird, again, look. So use your fecal egg count. Ask your vet to do a, um, a fecal smear where you take them in. Look, see if you still have a problem afterwards. Um, and then tell me, because <laughs> I'd love to know if you're, if you're, you know, if it's effective for you guys. Okay. This is Sam's PP begin. Well, both I don't know if you've noticed, I've done two talks and I have a pet peeve in each of the talk. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's a pet peeve or it's just something I, I think people maybe misunderstand, but the compounding. So compounding is anytime you break down a medication or a chemical from its original container into a smaller one, okay? And we have to do this a lot in veterinary practice just because of our range of products that are on label for our clients. Yeah, I mean, they come in often big bottles or many hundreds of tablets and like the customer doesn't want hundreds of tablets yeah, or hundreds a, of mills it's of product. It's costly. They're never going to use it. It's just yeah. a waste. But saying that, so it is advantageous to be able to break it down into smaller containers, you know, and, and be able to sell those to clients. So veterinarians and licensed compounders, like people like pharmacies, um, or there's actual like medication companies, there's people who actually just compound medications for like the hospitals and vets and stuff. Those people are legally able to buy a bulk product, break it down to smaller things and resell it. Okay. But most other people like off the shelf retail shops, pet stores and stuff, technically can't do that without a license. Yeah, and there's like fairly good reason for that because like, I mean, A, you don't know what's actually in the liquid that they're giving you or the tablets, Yes. which is, is just dangerous. You don't know the hygiene behind them putting them in those bottles as well, like whether that's, you know. Well, there's a lot of questions. Like, yeah, there's many the, questions. Like the, the picture on the right, other than the label, yeah, sometimes, again, we have had um, a few clients buy random wormers that have been very vague on information. And like, you know, a lot of these chemicals, like whilst they look fairly harmless to us, like they are so toxic. Yeah. So you have to be super careful around the use. And for that, you need someone like a vet who has written out your kind of dosage rates correctly. Like you you know someone you can blame if it gets messed up. <laughs> that's, the, that's the big thing. Yeah, that's essentially it. You just, <laughs> it you, need, you need someone to blame if it goes horribly wrong. Um, like this this bottle on the right here uh, of our presentation, that takes a, like for me to look at that, that takes a lot of trust to use that. Yeah. Like, is that just water? <laughs> You know, like five mils per liter of water repeat after 10 days. Is it moxidectin? Is there anything else in it? Like you said, was it bottled under like hygienic circumstance? Did they have alcohol in there? You know, like. These are all like really important questions. So like when, yeah, when getting compounded. Um, we, we go through a huge thing to register or even bring a product into the country. We've got to make sure the MPIs sort of approved it. It has a label. We go through an application process to make sure that it's made under good manufacturing practices. And there's a trail for us to sort of follow. Plus, there's a whole list of science and stuff behind uh, compounding. I mean, it, and it is all there to keep keep you and your, your chooks safe. Yeah. It's safe, essentially. So, I mean, if people are going to go about compounding, then it essentially means anyone that actually wants to like bring in anything and actually do something with it is going to be probably less willing to or likely to yeah. do so if other people are just being vigilantes. <laughs> well, it, I can see why they're doing it. Like there's a need for it. Yeah. Right. There's a need for it. That's how these things happen. And, um, you know, and they're just trying to be helpful. They really are. Um, but you can see where it can kind of go sideways if it's the wrong person doing it. Yeah. 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 Just be careful out there. You know, yeah. We don't want your birds getting sick. Be, be careful. 
all right, we're getting close to the end. And so this is kind of our, um, where we want to talk about programs and stuff like that. So I, I don't know if you've noticed, but I didn't go over what a good program or, or what my ideal program is. Um, the reason being is that there's lots of tactics in managing worms and it's going to depend on how big your flock is, where you live, <laughs> how much land you've got. <laughs> your bird density, your cleaning regime, yeah, how, your like, ability to clean. The ages of your flock, if you've got a multi-age flock or yeah, yeah. you've got like all the same age flock. Did you know like the reason why chicken farming went from sort of free range in 1935, 1940 to uh, sort of battery cage was because of worms, worms and coccidiosis. Mm -hmm. The, the reason they went into the cages is because they could remove the... So they're the ones to blame for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The parasites are the Someone ones to blame. Someone tells it. Yeah, it's the parasites. So like, because when you put a whole bunch of birds together, so this is bird density, these parasites build up in such a huge number that the immune system just can't control it. Like if you get a whopping dose of coccidiosis at one day of age, you know, your, your chicks won't last the week. Yeah. <laughs> So like there are other tactics. And I remember recently I got into a very interesting discussion with somebody who, uh, online who said, you, didn't, you don't need chemicals to control your worms. You just need rotational grazing. Yeah, and to be fair, rotational grazing, great. it is great. You can use it to great effect in like ruminants, like cows and sheep and stuff. It's not, really good. Not so fantastic if you only have 300 square meters of land in your backyard. Yeah, it can be it can be a little tight in an urban setting. <laughs> <laughs> Possible, but it can be a little bit tight. Uh, but there are some benefits to rotational grazing, including resting an area, letting sort of nature take its course on a on a, a run, a chicken coop run, you know, letting the grass grow, letting the sort of soil regenerate and getting that sort of biodiversity back. There's a lot of positives there. But if you have a big area, like, you know, you see those little uh, 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 tractor sort of coops and they're dragging them around the paddock and stuff, yeah. that actually works great for that because yeah, you, they're there a day and then they move them to a little bit further down and, and they're never on the same patch of grass, you know, yeah. for more than a couple of days. Like that works, you can really minimize a lot of issues that way, but that doesn't work for everybody, mm -hmm. right? So. But bird density plays a big part. If you are like most of our awesome clients, you have a lot of birds <laughs> and we love you for it. Uh, but bird density can play a big part in how you treat worms and parasites. Yeah, I mean, the more birds, the more poop. <laughs> That's basically it. That's pretty much it. And if you haven't got the sort of the space or time to kind of keep those things like clean, and yeah. yeah, so manure removal becomes big if you don't have a lot of space and you have a lot of birds, you have to think about that. And then cleaning and disinfection. So making sure whatever area you have them in, again, it can be cleaned down. The organic material needs to be pulled out as often as you can in those types of situations. Or you're composting. You know, if you have a composting floor at some point, unless, you know, your soil slowly developing higher and higher, you're going to have to pull it out and start again, right? So still cleaning and disinfection become important in those in those uh, circumstances. But I think we're at the next one is just the end one, I think. No, oh, no. no this is our most important. Yeah, it is. So if before you even try to figure out how you're going to control worms, the, the good thing is to try and like, do I have them? Uh, we've had a f more than a few clients who have gone down the fecal egg count thinking they had a problem and it comes back, they don't have any worms Which whatsoever. Which is amazing because then you don't have to use chemicals at all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is so good. Like it saves you a lot of time. It I mean, does. Yeah, all you have to do is collect up some droppings, chuck them in like a Ziploc bag and send them to the, the local lab or take them down to your local vet clinic. Yeah, um, call them ahead of time. Yeah. Call them ahead of time. I mean, we have <laughs> double we, double bag. Double bag. Like <laughs> be, a good be, a, yeah, be a good Kiwi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we offer the service on our website as well, just so yeah. that everyone has access to getting a fecal egg count done. Because I know that there are a lot of vet clinics that don't offer this or don't have the facility to do so. Yes. So if you don't have a vet clinic that has a facility, 
and you're quite happy sending poo in the mail like totally <laughs> just... hit us up on our website and you can order your own fecal egg count yep. um super easy you're just printing off form filling it in yeah sending it away with your sample make sure it's tidy yeah yeah we don't want I mean, sick courier drivers yeah. <laughs> you get these samples back like super quickly too like usually they only take like a day or two at max um after you've sent them away so they're um nicely effective yeah the, and the lab loves us how many chickens poop <laughs> can you get in one sample um well probably like they, they say probably between five and six you're pushing like the high limits i would say yep I would say so, but all, like even if you have a flock of like 20, uh, let's say you just do one sample of five or six birds. Uh, if you're doing that on a regular occasion, like it's pretty sensitive. You'll probably pick something up. Yeah, and generally if like, you know, the six of them show up like zero worms, the chances of your other 15 having worms are probably are, gonna be pretty low as well. Pretty low, which is great, so. The important thing about fecal egg counts is, is the sort of frequency that you're looking at too. So you're going to want to look probably a couple times a year. Uh, if you're not doing anything, at least twice a year. More, I would say, if you think you might have an issue. And I would focus on those times of years before, like before coming into lay. So if you know that they're, you, you, let's say you've gotten one egg so far, and you're just like, ah, oh, I better check for worms and make sure they're all right. When you get that one egg, grab grab some poo, send it off, have a look because. If you treat them, if you need to treat them with something that has a 10 day egg withhold, at least you're not destroying like weeks and weeks of eggs. You, it may just be a few if they're just starting out laying. Um, you know, mid winter is a great time to check uh, just because most of the birds are out of lay. And when they're immune suppressed in the winter time, it's a great yeah, that's way kind of, to sort of support them. That's when you want them to be like parasite free essentially yeah. like because i mean those are already hard times you don't need to make it harder for them well and they tend to at night congregate in the coops it's a bit of a higher risk yeah. uh time as well so it, it you know there are times of the years that you sort of want to target it that are probably better than others yeah. yeah um i'm just gonna add in there just because i just thought about it now uh apple cider vinegar and garlic and not women's <laughs> just just putting it uh, out there yeah. they're Great for acidifying water, which can keep bacteria down, but we do see that one thrown around a lot. Um, also, like the use of DE, which is not really... It, well, it has some small it's got some, studies. Yeah, some small studies, but considering how long it's been about, it, there's not really... Anything conclusive, really. Very conclusive. And like the mechanism of action still isn't really that understood about it, but like it's it's dangers it's seem not to it's not a safe yeah it's product. just it's not a safe product to use so we don't really recommend using that i mean essentially microscopic glass the only way that we can sort of begin to understand that working is that it is kind of inflaming the stomach lining up enough or the intestinal tract lining up enough that worms can't even bury themselves in there yeah. but for that you're just like that doesn't sound very good either so yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i i, I just I wouldn't I wouldn't go there like it's it's not fantastic um there's a lot there's lots of papers on it nothing for me nothing super stands out as being wow this is awesome there is some little effects in some of the papers but I think the health the health yeah. issues outweigh that yeah definitely <clears throat> when you have other issues like hey I could look to see if I have a problem <laughs> before treating with DE like that's probably the way to go yeah. minimize how much chemical you use is is the way forward and then once the science comes out on some of these other natural solutions we'll probably be some of the first people touting it because we love that sort of stuff a lot of yeah, our yeah. products we develop are natural tr like well we'll try to be alternatives that aren't antibiotics and yeah harsh i mean love garlic love apple cider vinegar yeah. but like understand what they are used for like what yeah. their actual benefits are because they do have some yeah um yeah, just, just like, well, oregano has lots of benefits, but the concentration yeah, in a con leaf versus yeah, you concentration know, essential oil is important. different. Yeah, yeah. Dose is important. Yeah. You know, so uh, yeah, like you said, garlic is awesome. Yeah. So we did have a question back here, oh, and I sure. have been meaning to get back to it um, about having wild birds hanging around and they're sharing their parasites. Yep. So any natural deterrence. Um, to, like wild birds are going to hang around for food essentially so uh, 
they're yeah. they're really hard. I mean, they're everywhere, and it's not just yeah. your sparrows; it is your like your earthworms and other like snails, all those sorts of things. They yeah. all pose a risk. It's not just your sparrow mates. The the best thing you can do for your birds if you're free ranging them is to is to support them through times of stress. Have a really good diet. Have a, a warm coop. Yeah. Have a, a uh, make sure you have like the diet needs to be well balanced so they're getting all those micronutrients that they need. Like there's a lot of things there. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> checking for worms and worming your birds when you need to is just, just kind of what you need to do really. Yeah. Like sparrows coming in, if you want to minimize their sort of well, the, the, their presence and you kind of just need to look more at like why are they why are they showing up if they're yeah. showing in mass flock amounts and you're just like maybe i need to put my food somewhere where only the chickens can get it like maybe in the morning in their like very tight in enclosure their yeah, in their and then part. like for the rest of the day they free range and there's no obvious access to food anywhere like yep. it's got to be so tricky with you do the birds learn quickly um sparrows especially they <clears throat> they survive on being uh opportunistic and uh, looking for patterns and, you know, taking advantage of situations. That's how they survive. Yeah. But uh, you, hopefully we can out, yeah, outthink them and, and uh, make sure that our, our birds are healthy. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend worming wild birds either. I'm just going to put that out there because you can't guarantee their dose again. So you may be yeah. creating like resistance <laughs> in nature and you don't want to be doing that because in worming them again, you could be killing yeah. off their like low like weaker worms and yeah, like leaving, the strong, leaving the strong ones and then those birds will just be shitting around really strong worms so don't ever worm your natural backyard birds yeah. like just don't do it <laughs> yeah 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 um, definitely we've got how much does the fecal egg cost i mean it's different everywhere our one on our website's 26 uh we have heard them go for like between 40 and like we've heard some that are higher than that yep. it all depends where you kind of get them we done. like we're i don't think we're turning a profit on ours no uh, we have a we handling just, fee on that the rest of it just goes to pay the lab yeah essentially that's i mean we just want to get them out there and want because generally the vets have um access to the lab or the vet clinics have access to the lab like the general public does not so we just wanted to create a sort of a situation where you could have pretty direct access to the lab if yep. you needed it because there's nothing worse than not being able to get a fecal egg count just because your local vet doesn't or you offer don't. them. Yeah, yeah. Or they're far <laughs> like, away or something. Yeah. yeah. So we're all for like not using chemicals when you don't need to. So yep. this is why we want to start up the service in the first place. Yeah, yeah. So you download the submission form, you fill out the parts, we show you how to fill it out and then you bag it up and courier it off. Yep. Um, can worms end up in chicken eggs? Oh, yes. yes, they can. So the way the anatomy of the chicken works is that the, the back end or the cloaca is a sort of a all, all roads end here. Um, that includes the oviduct as well. So yeah. if you have intestinal parasites, uh, there is a, a left hand turn straight into the oviduct. Mm. So you can get worms that are uh, accidentally sort of migrate up that way. Yeah. Um, your burden has to be pretty heavy for that to happen. They, there's no food in there for them. So something's gone wrong. <laughs> yeah. Which reminds me, actually, another another way to tell that your bird might have worms is actually in your eggs, is the yolk color can become oh, yeah. pale. That's right. That's it a can, good one. It can become very light. if Because, I mean, you can explain. You want me to explain that one? Well, OK. It. So this was an actual call that we went to. <laughs> So we had the, uh, a free range uh, egg farmer who uh, was having to downgrade the, well, the people he was selling his eggs to were complaining because they were so pale. Everybody likes the sort of yellowy yolks and stuff. Um, and they were complaining because the yolks were really pale and white almost in a lot of cases. And so the, the, the color of the yolk comes from uh, an addition to the feed, um, marigold extract, which is a flower. Uh, but it also comes from sort of those um, uh, pigments, uh, free ranging as well, you know, dandelions and insects that have it in them. So we went, they had very white eggs. They were on flubinol as well, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, we, yeah, yeah, we had, uh, they, we, we tend to recommend that they do multiple weeks of flubinol if they are going to use it, or there's a, a, a you can, 
put it in the feed at a lower rate continuously. But anyways, we had a look and they definitely had worms and it, the worms were causing an inflammation around the intestine, thickening the intestine and preventing a lot of those uh, pigments, which are really big molecules from being absorbed. So yeah, the, the worms weren't only just com out competing them for food, they were uh, disrupting a lot of the egg formation as well. Yeah, this is actually why, like, why I found it really like awesome when New Zealand started doing, they started implementing a um, tracking your egg um, situation oh, yeah. if you buy your eggs. <laughs> the free range egg numbers. Um, now it's not like um, mandatory. mandatory. It's like not compulsory that they do that. Yeah. I find it really sad that it's not compulsory because like I've bought enough eggs and had them become very disgustingly pale and I've been like, where did that come from? Yeah, and yeah. of course it's been one of those free range places that doesn't want to have their farm track oh, anymore. Really? Yeah, oh, okay. and I'm just like, ah, oh, man, that sucks. Well, so <laughs> it, is, it is an added cost, but they did that because they were having an issue of people yeah. not following the rules again like yeah just oh. mixing eggs and you were buying you were buying the label you weren't buying the eggs yeah, yeah um are there any specific considerations for ducks and geese in terms of internal parasites um well yeah the, the only real consideration is how are you going to give them the medication if you need to that's a big one ducks and geese feed way differently than chickens yeah, and like water and like water um, wormers and things can be real yeah. annoying to give to ducks, given that they put water everywhere. Yeah, um, well, they use water for more than just drinking. They use it to process yeah. feed and stuff like that. So sometimes dose rates on geese and, and ducks can be a little bit hit and miss. Um, but again, start with your fecal egg count, build your program yeah. out from I that. mean, the thing is, when if you do fecal egg counts through us, um, we will give you recommendations for wormers as well. Yeah. Like if you've got something that shows up in your fecal egg count, then we will give you a recommendation of how to go about treating that particular um, yeah. issue we, as we, well. We might even give you a call and just sort of work through what your program is. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. yes, there are there are differences for ducks and geese. <laughs> I, I would suggest if you have just a couple ducks and geese, just to give them the tablets. Yeah. Those are probably the easiest way to do it. If you have a lot of ducks and geese, we probably have to talk about getting a pellet formulated for you with lubidol in it. The water-based ones, I don't know how effective they are. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And you don't want to be syringing any of these guys. <laughs> if you have more than a few ducks, yeah, yeah, you don't. All right. If there's not any more questions. Are we done? Oh, we're in the questions category. Yeah. If anyone's got any more questions. Yeah, shoot. Like, I, I hope we didn't miss any, or if there are some, uh, now's the time. I think we've got a few more minutes, um, but we'll definitely put this back up on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll uh, be uploaded probably next, next week. week. Um, but yeah, thanks very much, you guys. If there's nothing else, um, enjoy yeah. the rest of your evening. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah, yeah. It was awesome. If you really liked our video, please like and subscribe.